Welcome to Intimate Fame, conversations with the famous and infamous like you have never heard. Success, love, history alive, history undressed, private lives intimately revealed. What if you were there? Now you are invited. Meet extraordinary people as you never have before. One person stories like no conversation you have ever been part of. James Dean, the ultimate symbol of rebellious youth, difficult and exposed, vulgar and sensitive, grieved and great. An actor unlike Hollywood had ever encountered, more explosive than Brando, more fragile than Clift. A rocket ablaze, a trajectory that would burst aflame tragically in but a few priceless years. Fate had other plans. September 30th, 1955, what of the last moments of his life? On that final day, in the hours, the minutes, the seconds, what of his past became present in the instant between life and death? What was in the mind of James Dean that he embraced in the final flash of existence on September 30th, 1955? Your life can flash before you in an instant. Join us for 9 30 55. Tonight, episode three. I can't get along with nobody, I guess. Makes you feel good when you're not wanted. September 30th, 1955, 7 a.m. I planned the escape for months. A lot like what he was planning to do with me. Probably where I get it from. I take a train to California. What I want to do is study acting, but I keep that to myself. I tell people I'm going to college. There is no way I'm going to tell anyone I want to study acting. The people I know in Indiana, they think, sure, that's fine and all in high school, but no respectable person grows up and wants that for a life. You can't trust actors, certainly not in Hollywood, because those are movie actors. I stay with him to get a residence for college entrance at UCLA. Start calling myself Byron James. No idea why I'm messing up my middle and first name. Think it sounds more fancy or something? Good thing I come to my senses. Who the hell wants to go see a guy named Byron that stars in a movie? Hook up with a fraternity just so I don't have to live with him and his new wife. Fraternity life is not for me. Fall behind in payments, get into fights. I can't take the tea sipping academic bull. So I bust a few guys in the nose and get myself kicked out. Seven forty AM. I am poor and uncertain about my future. Me against the world. Girls help. M men help. An actor must interpret life and, in order to do so, must be willing to accept all the experiences life has to offer. He must seek out more of life than life puts at his feet. I've never been obsessed about sexual byways, only what's the impression on my career. It's the 50s, everything is bohemian, everything is experimental. Clift and Brando are big stars. What, what I bring to it is, in one hand, I offer them something like Brando saying, Fuck you! And I have Clift in the other hand saying, Please help me! That's my game, at least. Nine o five a.m. I read *The Little Prince*, first book in high school. A clash between child and adult worlds of speed and cruelty. You talk like grown-ups, Little Prince cries. You mix everything up together. You confuse everything. Only the children know what they are looking for. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Never read a book where I feel it is 
so much me. I've read that book so many times, I've lost count. From the day I leave Indiana, I keep a copy of The Little Prince with me everywhere I go. It's in my apartment right now in Sherman Oaks. a.m. Actor Studio. I have a huge blowout with Strasburg and Kazan over a scene I do. I give them something I adapt from a book about bullfighting. They tear me apart in front of everyone. They say I don't know crap about bullfighting, and I'm thinking, and what the hell do you know about bullfighting, you damn phony? You don't even act. You just talk about it. Never do a scene there again. Just sit in the back sometimes. And one day, just walk out on the whole damn thing. Everybody thinks I am nuts to treat Strasburg and Kazan like that. Everybody tells me I will never work in New York, let alone Hollywood. When an actor plays a scene exactly the way a director orders, it isn't acting. It's following instructions. The director's task is just that, to direct, to point the way. Then the actor takes over. Screw them all. In less than two years, Kazan hires me to star in East of Eden. I guess he never really thought I was a dumb actor who doesn't know anything after all. It would be nice to hear that in a damn class. Eleven thirty AM I make a lousy passenger in a sports car. Any car, for that matter. I need to be behind the wheel. I drive fast, but I know what I'm doing. Truth is, street driving is much more dangerous than race driving. Racing, you got everybody going in the same direction, and everybody's a professional. You never have some guy coming at you head on. That's where you get in trouble. The most dangerous part of racing is driving to and from the track. 12.30 p.m. I rub people the wrong way. I am a serious-minded and intense little devil. I am so tense, I don't see how people stay in the same room with me. I know I wouldn't tolerate myself. I do get bothered when someone says I am mean and disrespectful. Because, actually, I am not. They take silence to mean I care little or nothing for them. They don't have the insight or don't care to exercise the insight in knowing that I am just a shy boy that doesn't know how to approach them. And instead of making an attempt to approach me, they just, well, they just write me off. 12.45 p.m. I am not stupid. I know what people think of me. I know what I do to people, make it feel like they don't exist, and that I can't care less. I'm not a very social human being, or a nice person to a lot of people. I'm not good at reaching out. I am so frightened of letting people in. I show you something of myself, and people show something of themselves, and they feel me backing off. I know they sense the isolation even when I'm the cause of it. There's something solid and focused, but I need to see things through to a point where those things relate to me. And then suddenly I just drop the issue or the person. I am as obsessed with people as I am with sculpture or poetry or a role, and then presto, I lose interest. I learned early on, it's better to reject love before it rejects you. 1.15 p.m. Kazan tells me Montgomery Clift tells him I'm a punk, but a hell of a talent. Kazan is in New York and sees a performance of me and we meet. He still hates me. 
he acts like he doesn't, but he hates me. Then he shows me the script of East of Eden, and it all makes sense. Everything he hates about me, he wants in a character. Cal Trask. Sends me to Steinbeck. Hates me even more than Kazan. I get my first big movie role because nobody fucking likes me. I quit the Broadway show I'm doing two weeks after it opens. Everybody acts surprised and shocked. That's what they all have to do, act surprised and shocked. Every single one of them knows deep down that they would do the same thing if it was them. One thirty p.m. My salary for East of Eden is $1,200 a week. A minimum 10 weeks. I get $12,000 total for East of Eden. I get $1,250 a week for Rebel Without a Cause. Total salary, $12,500. I get $1,500 a week for Giant. Total of $22,500. Kazan tells me when I get to California, there is great importance of living an outdoor life. Sunshine, exercise, food, and fucking. Just do all the healthy things and sleep. I know what he's saying. Kazan in the studio think I'm an odd-looking kid, and Kazan in the studio want to make me as handsome as possible. One forty p.m. Moving to Hollywood is my first airplane flight. My luggage consists of two overstuffed bags of clothes tied with string and my copy of The Little Prince. In Hollywood, everyone seems to either be making a movie or screwing. I behave like I'm a virgin. My sex pours itself into fast curves, broad slides and races. My motorcycle and MG are my girl. And I'm sleeping with my MG. My problem with Hollywood, I get told a lot I don't know the difference between acting as a soft job and acting as a difficult art. I don't know the craft, but I am ready to do anything. I'm impossible to work with, I know that. Stepping on actors' lines, making up the script. Actors just staring at me, not knowing where the hell I'm going or what they're supposed to say. I am just as annoying as all hell. Raymond Massey. Raymond Massey is a great actor. So they say. I think he moves like Frankenstein the monster. Poor man. I never say the same thing twice. I never stand in the same place twice. I think he's gonna kill me. <laughs> he sure as hell tells Kazan he's gonna kill me. But that is exactly what Kazan wants out of Mr. Massey. Playing a father who hates his son. Kazan gets exactly what he wants. It's some of Mr. Massey's best work. I'm not sure he ever really speaks to me. It is that hateful. But I hear he does admit to somebody that, despite me being such a prick, our scenes are great. Two fifteen p.m. On the last day of shooting East of Eden, Julie Harris knocks on my trailer. I am sobbing. It's over. It's over. Julie says, but Jimmy, it's just the beginning for you. And I say, yeah, but this is over. East of Eden is the only family I have. It's the only purpose I have. Lost boy now. Two forty five PM. I love my damn motorcycle. Love to take people up into the Hollywood Hills, race along Mulholland. I love to scare the hell out of people. 
people stop accepting my offer for a fun ride. I'm a good driver, but I have to be the fastest, the best, the most impressive. I've got to get to places in a hurry. There's just not enough time. 3.30 p.m. Coming to California, I decide not to be a nice guy. People need to respect me for the work. For me, rudeness is a kind of excitement. It is not that complicated. I just don't want people around. People think there is something desperate and disturbed about me. People think I am unformed. I come to Hollywood to act, not charm people. The only way I can be sure people truly love me is if they love me at my truly worst. 3.45 p.m. I can't get a handle on what is happening to me. There is something unreal about the sudden lurch of fame, and I hate the machinery of studio politics. Nick Ray's relationship with me makes me want to direct, to write, to produce. The Little Prince and Billy the Kid. I know this about myself. People sense me, but I never really know me. When you see Rebel, you see me up on the screen. Best performances never appear to be performing at all. Something true of ourselves is found in the characters we portray. 4.15pm. I have a year away from Warner Brothers. Nick Ray and me plan to use the time to get our own company started. We will do both feature pictures and television series which will allow me to break in as a director. I think I'll be a great director. 5.20 p.m. I am nurtured by Kazan. Raised up by Ray, torn apart by Stevens. I hate Giant. Third in billing. My name is above title in Rebel. It's a small role in a big picture. Everybody knows the only star is George Stevens, the director. Good lord, the title of the damn movie is George Stevens Giant. Truth is, an Elizabeth Taylor George Stevens movie is good for my career. Also, I am the character, Jet Rink, no doubt about it. You would think the character in the book is based on me. p.m. I am hell on Giant. In this small town in Texas where we are sent for location work, you can find me pissing in public all over town. I cause problems everywhere. I am bored. So bored. One hot night, me and a co-star sit around and eat a jar full of peanut butter, a box of crackers, six Milky Ways, and drink 12 Coca-Colas. Nothing is happening. I spend so much time sitting around, I will do anything for attention. I want attention so much, so desperately. It mattered so much that I have to treat it with contempt. I can't admit how much it means to me. Believe me, nobody has more problems with Jimmy than Jimmy. 5.35 p.m. Two nights ago, I'm at dinner at the Villa Capri with friends. The place is packed with a lot of the who's who and wannabe crowd. I see this very distinguished couple enter. I realize it's Alec Guinness with a lady friend. Not a table open, they turn to leave. Never met Mr. Guinness, and I see no reason why I should not this minute. I jump up from our booth and run and catch them. I ask him to join our table and they accept. I am through the moon. Every movie this man has made that I have sat in a theater and watched is flashing by me as he talks. It is the best night of my life. When we finish, I do what I've wanted to do all night. 
I take Mr. Guinness out to the parking lot to see my new Spider 550 I'm racing this weekend. I'm showing it off and going on about all the details of it and how fast it is, and I turn to Mr. Guinness, who hasn't said a word, but he is pale. Ghost color. I think he has gotten ill from the food or something. I ask him if he's okay. He looks up at me, right in the eyes, stone cold, and tells me, Jimmy, do not drive this car. I laugh and say, why not? It's a great machine, one of the best. He tells me, do not drive this car. Nothing good will come of this. I tell him, it's okay. I'm not superstitious. He tells me, this has nothing to do with superstitious, dear boy. I ignore his fear. I enjoy the night. Enjoy the ride to silliness. I ignore the warnings. Ignore the cautious laugh. Ignore the love offered. Never been able to do anything but embrace the free fall of my life. People will make of me what they will. I am called mean and kind, rough and tender, stubborn and yielding, vulgar and charming, straight and gay, honest and devious, most likely all of them and more. Whatever's the truth, you gotta live fast. 5.44 p.m. They say in a heartbeat your life can flash in front of you. Sounds like BS to me. That is until 5.44 p.m. September 30th, 1955. A day, an hour, a minute, a second. Turns out I'm wrong. Your life damn well does flash in front of you in a heartbeat. We all have a lot more to remember than we think. Intimate Fame, created by Scott Edward Smith, 93055. Written by Scott Edward Smith. James Dean, performed by Casey Hawks. Original music by Chesney Hawks. Associate producer, Melissa Job, Produced by Howard Bluss. Please join us for upcoming productions of Alexander the Great, Mary Queen of Scots, Taylor and Burton, and more from Intimate Faith.